All right, just a couple more minutes. So if anybody out there is on YouTube right now, uh, just hang tight. We're going to go ahead and get started here in about two minutes. And uh, if we could open the room here uh, on the um, Zoom side as well, that'd be great. You're good, Hector. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, did we open up the room already here on the Zoom side? All right, awesome. It looks like we're starting to let people in here. We're gonna be starting here in about one minute. So for those of you that are joining us right now, uh, let's go ahead and get started by just making your way over here to the chat feature. So today what we're gonna be doing is having an awesome workshop here. We're gonna be doing a lot of live drawing today with Brian Hess, our Associate Director here of the Game, De uh, uh, the game Development Program. Uh, so what I wanna do really quickly is uh, just have everybody make your way over to the chat button and adjust your chat to all panelists and attendees. So I'm gonna go ahead and write hello in there. Welcome students, but please uh, let me know where you're from. Go ahead and respond back in that chat. First person, Chris Gonzalez with a yo. All right, we have Texas here in the house tonight. Thanks for being here. Sasha from Chicago, San Diego, New Orleans, Utah, Minneapolis, Lebanon. Hey, all right. North Carolina's here, Bay Area. What's up, Oscar? Thanks for being here. The Valley Center area. All right, we have South Carolina. It's moving pretty quickly. Thank you all for participating there. Just make sure that if any of you have not already, some of you are writing to all panelists. Make sure that you're adjusting to all panelists and attendees. That's how we're going to be able to interact with you, take your questions, answer questions. I'm definitely going to be taking questions out of the chat and handing them over to the stars of our show tonight. Uh, so I just want to make sure everybody's familiar with this. So before we get started, a couple of quick things here. So I uh, just want to welcome everybody. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us. We love having you. These events are awesome. You're attending now our workshop, which is Learning to See develop your own unique style with video game pros. Uh, so we have Mr. Brian Hess and Mr. David Goodwine here with us live tonight. So it should be a hoot. Uh, but before we get started, a couple housekeeping things. I just want to make sure everybody's aware. You can ask questions in the chat. We want you to have fun. So interact with us as much as possible. Make sure to ask your questions, give your feedback. The more, the better. Uh, we're definitely going to be covering a lot of content and we want to answer all of your questions. So Pay attention here in the beginning when I introduce uh, Mr. David Goodwine, our executive director here, uh, but also just make sure that you're participating and you're going to get the most out of it. We have a lot of talented folks here at the Academy and our job here tonight is to teach you some cool stuff and also introduce you to our programs. One of the other things I want to throw out here tonight is this. If anybody out here is interested in joining the school, I don't care what grade you're in. I don't care if you're in high school, if you're out of high school, if you're looking to be a graduate student you're domestic or international. Uh, my role here is I run admissions for all schools and all departments here at the university. So my number one goal is to connect with every single student. Um, part of our process here is really different and unique. What we do here is we meet with our students one-on-one. -on -one. We try to get to know them, ask questions about what their career goals are, where they see themselves in the future. So if you're enjoying what you're seeing and you have any interest in the university, any questions, anything we can do, our number one objective would be to have a one on one conversation with you in order to go over what the steps would be for you to proceed forward. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw my email out there. Please do not be shy. Send me an email no matter what the question is. I want to connect with you after the event and set up some time to talk. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start off with introduction. So I'm going to introduce uh, a wonderful guy. I've had the pleasure of knowing him for about six years now had the pleasure of traveling with them to New York City, all the way from California, coast to coast. Uh, so David Goodwine is our executive director here at the School of Game Development. So a little bit about David. He's an animation and visual effects graduate here at Academy of Art University. He's been in the entertainment industry for 18 plus years, including 14 years in the game industry. David has worked for companies such as Double Fusion, 
IDOS, which is also Crystal Dynamics, Electronic Arts, and PDI slash DreamWorks. His game credits include projects such as 25 to Life, Legacy of Kane Defiance, Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, and The Return of the King, Project Snowblind, and Tomb Raider Legend. David also has worked on feature films such as Evolution, The Mexican, The Deep End, The Ledger of Bagger Vance, and one of my personal favorites, Shrek 3D. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over here to David Goodwine. I'm going to be your host, Hector Verdugo, the Senior Vice President of Admissions. I'm going to be in the chat for your questions, and I'll see you all at the end of the show. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Hector. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. So um, Hector told you all about me. So uh, I am going to introduce Brian. Brian Hess is our Associate Director for our department. Um, he teaches many classes for us. Uh, and today he's going to be uh, talking about uh, sketching and drawing today. So I'm gonna let him say what he needs to say. All right, uh, how's everybody doing tonight? Uh, please, like Hector said, please interact uh, with the chat. Um, tonight, we're just gonna be going over a little bit of character design, a little bit of drawing, a little bit of uh, you know trying to figure out who your character is, what they're doing. And I'm gonna be starting it off by doing kind of like uh, a sample of an image. And so I'm gonna go ahead and share uh, my Cintiq. So that is one of the first questions that we get. Usually when I have concept artists or designers even, um, they come up to us, 3D modelers, they say, what kind of hardware do you have? Um, and so what I'm drawing on tonight is a, Wac a Wacom Cintiq. Um, there's a lot of different tablets you guys can use, uh, whether it's Wacom, Huion, um, there's XP Pen, uh, there's also an Intuos tablet, which is not um, a tablet which you're drawing on like like a screen. It's just a normal tablet where you look up at the screen and draw down on that tablet. So um, the technology is extremely important for um, for what we do in our department. But it's also if you have those fundamental drawing skills, we really want to push that. Like if you can draw on paper, you can draw on a tablet. And so. What I'm doing here is I've drawn a couple things. And so I have this kind of superhero guy. I have this dog kind of character. I was gonna draw him with this big, like kind of Gatling gun or machine gun. And then I have this smaller character. And so what I think I'm gonna do is I think I'm gonna go with this kind of uh, superhero character tonight, okay? Um, and so what I normally do uh, is in the studio uh, is what I'm tasked with, uh, you know, coming up with a character. Um, so just to give yourself uh, a little background on what I did. So um, I've worked in everything from comics uh, to I do a lot of storyboarding for television, uh, for pilots and stuff like that. I've done a lot of a lot of that. Um, and then I moved from animation into game art um, and game animation. I've done a lot of that, too. Um, I've worked at places like uh, Zynga. Um, and a couple other like mobile companies. I've done a lot of educational games, that kind of stuff too. Um, and then I've also, uh, most recently, I worked at Tiny Co, which is now Jam City. Um, and one of the last games I worked on was Family Guy and the Quest for Stuff. So I've worked on stuff with really well-known IPs and I've also done stuff that's more centered on uh, creating uh, characters and environments and worlds and stories. Okay. So here's a sketch. It may look really rough, um, but that's kind of where you want to be. Okay. And so what I do is I usually take that sketch and I draw over it multiple times. Okay. Here, let me make sure I got the chat up just in case I, sorry about that. It kind of went away. Okay, cool. All right. So what I'll do here is I'm going to start going over this sketch. And I did like a pre-sketch before I even started this just, just to get things going. Um, but what I'm asking myself is, you know, what is this character? What does he do? What's his purpose? Like, what's his game plan? That kind of a thing. Um, so I wanted to make this kind of superhero character um, with a backpack. And that's kind of where I'm starting today. Um, a lot of the questions that we get uh, with students coming into the department is, What's it like to work in a studio? What's it like to be an artist in a studio? And I'll tell you, 99% uh, of the time, you will not be drawing what you wanna be drawing. 
and David can talk about this too, but um, you are always going to be drawing what whatever game comes up. And so if you uh, apply at a studio where you, you, know, you really want to work on the IPs or the projects that they're working on, and then something comes up, you really don't have a choice. You have to work on those projects that they're working on within that studio. And so when you're coming up with, with uh, concepts for new characters, for new IPs, that's one thing. Uh, working with existing IPs, that's where a lot of the research comes in. And so, um, David, when you worked on upgrading Tomb Raider or updating Tomb Raider, do you remember how any of that went? Oh, yeah. So, uh, so HD was just coming out and we had to, we were going to be the launch title on um, Xbox 360. So for uh, Tomb Raider Legend, um, and really nobody knew how to do HD at the time. So we had to figure that out. Uh, and that was, it was great. It was a lot of work and there was a lot of unknowns and we had to figure it out. So, but it turned out really well. Um, but it, we, it, it took some doing to get us to the point where we were actually doing cinematics in HD. And at that time, uh, Microsoft, at the very bare minimum, they wanted 720p and uh, they would like 1080, but most people weren't able to do that at the time yet. So it was, it was expensive to buy the equipment, <laughs> but uh, it turned out really well. So yeah, is, and, and that's the thing is every time we change, you know, I look at now we've got PS5, we've got that new Xboxes, we're, we're up to 4K. They keep talking about 8K and we have to, we as an industry have to adjust for that. That was another thing. So when you're working on a game, you know, a lot of times they're doing a lot of reboots, a lot of rehashes, a lot of, you know, that kind of stuff, sequels, like after the fact too. And so, um, I can, you know, like I worked on reskinning like an entire Angry Birds game that never ended up coming out. You know, I can't talk about the specifics of it, but, you know, working with that IP, a really well-known IP, um, there was like some, you know, other titles that, you know, David and I probably can't even talk about, but there's a lot of games that make it all the way up into the production and then just get canceled too. That happens quite a bit in in a, in a studio. And sometimes, you know, you get to, you get a chance to work on something really neat, and then it, and then it just gets taken away from you. But it's really cool and it's really good experience to get. And so um, that's kind of like, you know, just a glimpse of what it's like to work in a studio and work on like a different uh, or or like a new project or a new IP that kind of a thing. Um, what we like to do in the department is, you know, try to get you guys ready for what it's going to be like to work in a studio. And so all of our faculty either work in a studio or worked previously in studios. And so we like to, you know, help give you as much advice as we can, not only in techniques, but also just getting you uh, mentally ready to go out there and get a job. Okay. So here, so I kind of have this idea where I'm going to have the superhero kind of flying up. Hey, get ready, Brian. Go. Yeah. So a uh, question was, um, do you start with gesture or do you have reference? So with this one, I don't have any reference. Uh, I know that's, that's probably not what <laughs> you want to hear, uh, but yeah, no, usually you do so much research. You create mood boards, which are basically collecting image reference um, to give people an idea of the look and feel for what you're going for. Um, the illustration that I'm doing tonight um, is something where, you know, it's something where I'm showing you how to build a drawing very quickly. Um, but if I was doing this in a studio, there would be a lot more like kind of research that would go into it. All right, so now that I have this blocked out with the gesture, like you said, um, I'm gonna go ahead and start doing like uh, final inks on it, okay? And so I'm gonna go ahead and ink this character. And if you guys have any questions, uh, just let me know and we can, we can talk about whatever you guys wanna talk about tonight. 
if you guys have any questions about the school or the department or the programs, just let us know and we can go over any of that. Well, a question that came in was, uh, uh, what is a pro and con um, or what are some of the pros and cons that you should be aware of before getting into this industry? Um, I think the biggest misconception is uh, it's kind of like those, uh, you know, you have those kind of glasses on or those, you know, you're seeing it through um, rose colored glasses. Yeah. Where everything is perfect and you get to like, like kind of how I started with, you get to work on whatever you want. Um, you know, a lot of students come into the department wanting to uh, start their own studio and, and those that's cool. We have actually had students that have come into the department and they've started their own studios after they left. Um, but that's really hard to do getting capital, getting people, you know, connected with you. But, you know, we try to get people prepared to work with other people. And we have actual classes, our collaborative classes that set everybody up for that. And so what we do is we have projects within those classes and it's basically student run. Uh, David and I actually run that class and we actually uh, treat it like a studio as much as we can um, within the uh, learning environment. So I don't know if you want to talk about some sure. of the projects we've done there, David. So, um, well, right now, so we've, we've been doing this forever, uh, since pretty much since the department started. But uh, a few years back, we started working with the uh, Norman Rockwell Museum and we built out a uh, VR experience for them that we showed at probably about five or six different museums across the United States. Um, we had a, uh, we showed also at the, uh, at the White House, uh, the VR piece that we created for that. Um, so, you know, having those opportunities, the students work is getting in front of actual people out there in the field, not just at school. Um, right now we're working with uh, NASA to create uh, some games for them for uh, their space station uh, project. Um, we're also working with, uh, so it was the 80th anniversary of Bruce Lee. And so we're in the process of uh, doing a project with the uh, Chinese Historical Museum in San Francisco uh, about Bruce, and we're creating a, uh, a you know, an animated piece for Bruce, basically like a hologram. Um, but all those projects like that are being done uh, through the collabs. So, and it's not only just our department that we have in there. We have music, we have animation, we have other departments that help out as well. Um, so we have those projects that are on the outside, but then we also have projects that uh, students and faculty come up with about particular games. We are always trying to do at least one 2D game uh, and 3D game uh, of our own projects as well. But like Brian said, we've had students get together, uh, you know, after they've graduated, they've started up their own companies. Um, we have one that's just, he, he and his company, he started it, the game as a uh, master's thesis. And then he did that one, uh, it was up on, it's still up on Steam. And then the second version of it is coming out, I think sometime in May. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, the students out there doing that and the students out there that are working at many, many companies that are here in the Bay Area, uh, LA, Seattle, all over the place. So, and we have a lot of students that are from other areas too, like other countries and they're, they go back and work in, um, you know, England and Australia and New Zealand and all over, so. I think the best part of the collabs, though, is, you know, not only are you working on something that's going out into the world, or it's something that, you know, you or your peers have kind of come up with, but it's, it's the amount of feedback that we've gotten from the industry after they, you know, they've learned like what there's, what the students have gone through and they start working, you know, there's certain programs that we use in those in those collab and those collaborative projects uh, and classes that 
you know, you use in the studio, like Perforce. It's a version control um, software where, you know, that's something that, you know, the larger studios use, um, you know, and, and the, the studios love that, you know, you come in with that experience and you don't have to have this huge ramp up. And that's, that's just one thing that I think that we really prepare you for is, is trying to get you up to date with the technology um, and the mindset of working as a team too. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm going through and I'm doing flat colors. Okay. I did a loose kind of inking pass on it. Um, I am going to clean it up, but I'm going to go ahead and start choosing colors for this guy. Okay. If you guys have any more questions, let us know. Do we have any questions that involve uh, game design? Not just any art, but any game designers out there today? There was actually a question earlier, Brian, I'll, I'll, I saved to throw at you and um, it was earlier and it said, do you get any chances to reuse the assets you make for IPS uh, that get tossed? Um, do you want me to take that? Yeah, you can take that if you want, go ahead. And I'll add so, it. Yeah. You keep drawing. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so it depends. Uh, usually when, let's say you make one game, I can prime example. Let's say we're working on Tomb Raider uh, Legend and then we go to make another version of that game or a sequel. Uh, there's assets that we could still use over um, from what we had done the, the you know, previous game. So that cuts down on production time, right? Um, but the, here's the thing. If it's a game, let's say we made whatever game it is, X game, um, and we shelved the whole thing. Could we use, if, if it was happening in the same world and the kind of the same environment, maybe um, it's possible that we could reuse the work um, and it, it, it would be to our benefit to do that because we don't have to spend the time and money uh, to create that again. Um, but it, it, it really depends on if it's going to fit within that world or not. And most times assets get updated too. Yeah, uh, that exactly. Yeah. So even if you have like a sequel to like Tomb Raider or something like that, um, oftentimes they will update the model, you know, like um, and they do that in film, they do that in games, they do that in everything. And so if you're watching The Incredibles 2, it's not the same model as it was in The Incredibles 1, that kind of thing. Um, you know, not just because of, you know, like the look, but also the technology that's going on in between the sequels for the games too. That kind of happens. Yeah, I mean, I, I was reading some of the questions. So just one of the things is if, if you're going to, if, if, the, if your passion is becoming a concept artist, I, I don't care what age you are, you have to draw all the time. You have to all the time. Yep. So if you're standing in line to get coffee and the line, draw. If, if you're sitting somewhere and you're just hanging out, draw there too. Because the only way, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're using paper or a Wacom or whatever you're drawing on or with, just as long as you're drawing and seeing. Yeah. Um, that's the thing that is, is going to help greatly. No, being a concept artist is being a visual problem solver. And so it's not just about drawing cool stuff. I mean, at the end of the day, it is really fun to draw cool stuff, but um, it's not just about drawing stuff. Like everything you draw has to have a purpose to it. Um, every little prop, every little line in the costume, you know, I know that I'm, I'm just sketching tonight. Um, but if, if this, if I was really taking this character uh, to fruition, there, there would be so many different iterations of this character and different styles and, and different, different, like, you know, hairstyles, different costumes, different everything. Oh, here I'll answer. So from YouTube, they were asking uh, in game development, do you learn everything or do you take courses for what you want to do 
like animation or concept art. So for our department, we, uh, we don't, when you come in, let's say, so the areas that we focus on are concept art, 3D art, game design, um, technical art, and programming. So of those uh, areas, you know, there are core classes in the beginning, foundational classes that you'll take. And pretty much all of you will, you know, whoever is a freshman, sophomore are all going to take pretty much the same classes. Um, but as you uh, break off into your major, you will be taking classes that are specific to the area. So if let's say you were going to be a concept artist, then um, you would take those drawing classes, those uh, painting classes, those kind of things. If you're going to be a game designer, you're going to be taking classes that are more focused in uh, level design and game theory and, you know, how do I make this game fun? How do I, how do I make this game, you know, all the mechanics that go to it? What am I going to do in this game? Technical artists are more about rigging, uh, uh, visual effects, that kind of thing. We we as a department don't have a specific animation track. The animation department has that. Um, the thing is, you just have to learn how to, if you want to work on games as an animator, um, the principles of animation are the same. Just what we work in, because we're working in real time and animation is working in, uh, in linear, right? So it's it's you're looking at it as I'm rendering this. It's a film. It's a passive experience. Whereas for us, it's an interactive experience. So we have to run everything through a game engine. Um, those lines are really blurring now. Uh, and a lot of uh, film companies are starting to use like the Unreal Engine to start to uh, create their, uh, their, their shows. Uh, Mandalorian is one of them that uses the Unreal Engine to create their uh, piece. So, um, like I said, those lines are starting to blur. But, um, but from our department, the areas that I said, those those are what we focus on. Yeah, like David said, they're using Unreal. They're using you know what company with Maya to build out those uh, virtual environments for shows like The Mandalorian. But there's also um, you know, a lot of television that's getting into that too, not just live action, but actually animated. And so with the the new version of Unreal and all that stuff that kind of goes into that, um, they're starting to use it for everything. So we have a lot of people um, from the animation department that are coming up and, and saying, hey, how do you use this engine? So right. exactly. um, like David said, you know, getting started in the animation department and then you know figuring out the basics the principles of animation that's you know david and i started out as animators that's you know kind of yep. where we came from and this is where we ended up you know what exactly. i mean exactly so, um, well and I, that, that's the thing too here let me ask this answer this real quick so yes game development is where game art falls into yes exactly so game think of game development as an umbrella and then under game development it's game concept art, game 3D art, game design, game technical art, mm -hmm. and game programming. So um, those are those are our main areas for that. We have we have some students that are interested in UI UX, but we don't we don't have a specific uh, uh, track for that right now. Maybe later we will. Um, those are areas that uh, are, are very in high demand. Um, we just need more people in there that want to do that. <laughs> so uh, somebody else, oh, here. Um, well, here, let me ask you this, Brian, I'll let you answer this. Yeah. So if, can, can a concept artist also be an illustrator? Yes, because that's what I am. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, no, it's, you know, uh, we talk about the different industries for, for a reason. Um, there's a lot of, not to overuse this corny term, but you know, there's a lot of cross pollination between animation, film and games now, yep. um, because everything is getting so you know, high fidelity. You know what I mean? Um, when you're playing the new Call of Duty or you're playing the new you know, 
whatever, you know, uh, a God of War, you know, pick, you know, choose your poison there. But when you're playing those new games, um, you know, they are full experiences now. It's not just playing Mario and jumping on a platform. You're living through an entire story. And so um, where I'm going with this is when you're creating, you know, concept art for a game, you know, that could be used for a film. It could be used as a basis for a film. It could be used as a basis for a television show. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard of The Last of Us. That's going to be a TV show. Can you imagine like working on a game and having it evolve into that and having your designs kind of taken from the game and built up into a television show and the live action? Um, I think it's kind of incredible. You know what I mean? So, um, and that's just one example. Like there's going to be a Halo TV show coming out. And so um, being an illustrator, being a concept artist, um, you know, we have students that um, went through our entire program and, you know, they're working at DreamWorks. You know what I mean? They're working at 2K. They're working in Disney. At, yeah, in Disney. You know, they're, they're all over the place. And so uh, to my long winded answer, <laughs> Is yes, but I, you know, understanding that you can do a lot with with the degree if you build out your portfolio enough, um, you know, and have enough variety in there. I think that's really important. So here, I got I got one question for you. Um, you know, I had said about drawing all the time and everywhere you go, and so they're asking, how do you not get discouraged, and or how do you not get burnt out? I get burned out all the time. That I'm just being honest. I get burned out all the time. I'm burned out right now. I'm working on two books that are going to publication right now. And I'm teaching and I'm working on a video game. You know what I mean? So well, and um, also you you're full time as an associate director too. So <laughs> yeah, and I'm a dad. And yeah. I, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? I'm married. I got all this stuff going on. But uh, I'm and, and the reason why it doesn't bother me is because I love doing it. I love doing this stuff. I love creating. I love um you know, creating something new and, and building on it and seeing people enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like, that's why I draw comic books. I know it has nothing to do with games, but it gives me a break and it gives me a lot of joy. I don't get paid a lot of money to draw comic books, but it's so much fun creating. I just want to keep doing it. And it's a way that I can do it independently. But in terms of, you know, you getting discouraged, that happens with everybody. Yep. You know, that's something that's going to happen to you your entire career. Uh, the minute you feel like you're getting ahead with your skills, you're going to look across the way or look on the internet um, and see somebody uh, who's, who's doing better than you are. And, and that happens and your skills are going to grow, you know, uh, your whole career, your whole life. And if this is something that you're passionate about, it's just going to keep happening too. And so, um, you know, it, it needs to be a full-time commitment. You know, this isn't something that you just kind of passively do. Um, you know, it's a creative field and, you know, you can get discouraged really quickly or you can take that and turn it around and, you know, and play into it and, and kind of feed off of it. And, you know, it's okay to take breaks sometimes and, and kind of, you know, pull back and, and relax. But, like David said, I, I rarely go a day without drawing something. I don't care if I'm sketching. I don't care if, you know, I'm drawing something with my kid or something like that. I'm always drawing something. So just keep drawing and, you know, uh, keep looking at other people's work and try to be inspired by it instead of letting it, you know, kind of discourage you. But I think the other thing is, too, is just make sure you're doing other things as well. You know, when I say drawing all the time, I don't literally mean, you know, 24 seven because getting out there and doing other things that have nothing to do just helps you uh, kind of keep your mind open to looking at other areas. Right. Mm -hmm. And it also helps you with your designs. It helps you with everything. It, it helps, you know, like with Brian and I being animators, doing all the different things we've done over our lifetime um that has helped my animation i mean um you know this is my this is basically my third career um and i started out with a degree in exercise physiology and i did that for like eight years but not what i wanted to be doing um and when i had the opportunity to go back to school 
uh, and get my second degree from the Academy of Art, um, that's where I wanted to be. I, that's what I really wanted to be doing. I had always wanted to be an animator. Um, but at the time it was, it wasn't as, uh, there weren't, there weren't schools out there for it when I first got out of high school. So, you know, <clears throat> I picked the science route and, but it, it just wasn't what I wanted. So I was, I was in my thirties when I went back to get my second degree and got it in animation. And I've been doing this, what, almost over 20 years now. So, and, and I tell this to students at school is, you know, yeah, are there times you're tired or burned out or any, always, you know, that happens, but there's not been one time that I've thought, why did I ever do this? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you just got to keep that in mind. It's a lot of work. This making games is not a cakewalk, um, but you get to see what comes out of this at the end, which is great. Yeah, that's, that's a big question we get where, you know, people, I don't think uh, people quite understand how much work actually goes into creating the, in any game. Uh, it's, it's a lot, a lot of work. What were you going to ask, Hector? Well, it was really just more of a chime in because, you know, I, I've seen so many different things about burnout and motivation. And I would just tell anybody, um, I don't care if you're in the game industry or you're working at <laughs> bank. It looks like, yeah. Burnout is an association with any career path you choose, yep. no matter what you do. So I guess the thing is this, is that do you feel like your highs and your lows that you're going to experience in no matter what you're doing, at least if you're choosing something where you enjoy it, you're more likely to experience more highs in your career and fulfillment in what you're doing, uh, because there's going to be lows in anything that you do. And so... Um, other thing I would just throw out there to anybody is saying if you're if you're questioning your work and you're questioning your, um, you know, you're just questioning yourself and people talking about how do you, you know, how do you stay motivated? I would tell you to you really just have to look at your losses as a learning experience and grow from it mm -hmm. and look at it as opportunities to get better at what you do rather than uh, throw in the towel, you know, and I, I'm a little older than maybe some of the students, you know, I'm younger than David, but we all grew up in the era when you played a video game and you didn't, if you didn't, <laughs> if you didn't beat it, you had to start all over again. You know? And it, and I think in, in a weird way, it's one of those things where you tend to condition yourself to be a little bit more of a fighter and a little bit more of somebody that's going to go back to the drawing board and say, I'm going to continue to work on getting better and better rather than giving up. And I hope that, you know, maybe that resonates with people out there of just saying, you know what, like it's okay to not always be successful, but it, you know, it's really what you do when you fail and it's what you do to basically make those improvements that are going to make you great. Yes. For so, sure. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Philosophical. <laughs> What's that? Maybe that's too deep for tonight, but <laughs> I no, I don't thing. think that's too deep. I think that the thing is with that kind of stuff, it's just, you know, there, there's, and you're definitely right about it. it. Doesn't matter what area of focus or whatever career you have chosen. Um, there's always going to be burnout. It really depends on, you know, how much, but, but the thing is, it's how you handle it and yeah. how you, you know, sometimes you need to walk away from things, even your art. If you're working on a design, like a character or whatever it is, and it's just not working the way you want it to, sometimes you need to step away from it and go do something else. Um, cause that's been, I've done that in the past and that has, and I've just went for a drive or run or whatever, um, just to get my head thinking about something else. And then usually I come up with another solution to, to that. Right. Yeah. Um, if you keep trying to hammer on it, you, you may not get anywhere. So I am actually going in and I'm creating all these spaceships that are kind of surrounding everything. I'm just having fun with this. I'm just trying to do something a little, little different than I normally do. Okay. So um, here's a question. This was earlier, but um, so style wise. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, style is, is something where, um, 
you know, I was, you know, I'm, I'm 38, you know, I'm not going to shy away from how old I am, but I'm inspired by different things than, you know, than David is, you know, or Hector, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, you know, even, you know, Hector, even if he doesn't see himself as somebody who will draw, he's still like kind of leans towards something. So, you know, my style uh, is from, you know, is inspired by Disney, but it's also inspired by uh, my favorite comic book artist that I grew up with, like Jim Lee. Um, who's now the head of DC Comics. He was a huge influence on the style that I have and kind of, you know, the the comics and the cartoons that I watched. I grew up with Batman, the animated series, X-Men, that kind of stuff. Um, before there was an MCU, that was my MCU. You know what I mean? Watching X-Men on Fox Kids, that was my Saturday morning. And so that was my inspiration. You know, if you're inspired by anime, you know, which there's so much good anime out. You know, like there's actually so much you can't even watch it. Um, you can't, you, I mean, if you, if you sat down and tried to watch it all, that'd be a full-time job, you know what I mean? But, um, you know, being inspired by an artist or artists or kind of, that'll build kind of this amalgamation of the style that you will eventually become. And so what I tell my students is, you know, who are you inspired by? I want you to tell me. And then I look at their art, we go through it together. And then I look at the art that they're creating and I say, all right, what can you pull out of that style? What can you do with that style? And so usually that's where we start and we start pulling elements from there and, you know, without completely copying that artist, but, but borrowing what's good or what you find interesting about. It. And that's, you know, and trying to find your own style is one thing. Um, another thing is, is sticking to a style in a studio and that's a totally different thing. And so, um, you know, what I try to say there is try to be as diverse as you can expose yourself to as much as possible. Now you can't possibly absorb everything, but if you're watching sci-fi, if you're watching adventure, if you're watching drama, if you're watching Westerns, you know, a fantasy, whatever, um, if you're exposing yourself to all of those things and, they don't have to exactly be, you know, the thing that you're really into. But if all you're watching is post-apocalyptic movies like Mad Max or something like that, and you're not paying attention to something like Lord of the Rings or Blade Runner or RoboCop or Predator or Terminator or, you know, anything like that, like John Wick, there's a lot of awesome art direction and color in John Wick in those movies, even though they're live action. Um, you know, watch a Star Wars movie if you haven't watched those. Watch the older ones. Um, you know, watch uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. Watch Citizen Kane. You know, and, and, it's, and it's just going back to film. You know, everything is derivative from something else. And so if you go back, you start seeing stuff in those old films, in those old games, like play old games too. You know, a lot of times when I bring up playing Older games, you know, and when I say older games, I mean that were made in the 80s, the stuff that I played as a kid, stuff that I grew up with. Like people don't want to play it, but what they don't realize is like what kind of goes back to what Hector said too. You want to play those games. You need to figure out where the games like came from. You know what I mean? You need to, honestly, it sounds corny, but getting back to the roots of, of where all these games came from. Uh, so you can see kind of, you know, the history and understand where, you know, where all this stuff came from. And I think, you know, and, and style is the same thing. And so trying to figure out, you know, kind of what kind of style you're going for with your own portfolio by looking at the artists that work at those studios that you want to work at, but also paying attention to the world around you and, you know, like the inspiration that's going through, cause, cause there's stylistic trends that go through. And I'm sure you guys, understand that and see that and so when you look at a game like overwatch for a while everything got stylized you know like when you saw when when fortnite came through everything was stylized for a while but right before that everything was super gritty and so things go in waves and it hits the industries in waves too you might see two movies that are very similar that come out at the same time okay and that's that's kind of it and so paying as much attention as you can to the industry and and where they're going and and what's going on in it and looking at what's coming out too, paying attention to 
not just the studios that you're into, but maybe other studios around you. The other thing is too, with that, um, you know, a lot of people start out with anime as a, a way to start out drawing in that, but it can't be the only thing you draw. Um, you need, you really need to look at having more than that in your wheelhouse. Um, it, 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 if you're drawing those and it's helping you draw in the, in the beginning, that's great. But as you move through and, and <coughs> excuse me, you are, uh, you know, wanting to look at other companies or look at companies to go work at, um, you really need a diverse, uh, portfolio. And just having anime in your portfolio is uh, is a hindrance. May I ask a couple of questions to you all? Sure. Yes. So I'm sure there's a lot of students that are on the event right now. And uh, if you're in the chat right now and you want to just throw me an amen, go ahead. But there's a lot of students out there that are probably questioning, like, should I do this? Uh, Am I going to be good enough? Uh, am I choosing the right career path? Uh, is this just like a joke? Like, should I, you know, just draw for fun and then go get a job doing something else? Um, so my question to you all is like, David, you, you were in a totally different field. Um, yep. And like, what made you guys take the plunge? Like what made you guys say, all right, I'm going in, I'm doing well, this. And, I'm, and it's not a farce. It's not a pipe dream. It's not. No you know, I'm one in 10 billion people that actually get the job. Like what made you take the plunge to say, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to believe in myself and I'm going to go for the career. Right. So here's the thing. When I, when I was going to San Diego state and I was getting my, uh, let me back up. So I've always drawn, right. I, I drew when I was younger. Problem was I never kept anything. I would just draw it, give it away, do it for other things. I just never really kept a hold of anything that I drew, right? Um, I, I watched tons of cartoons, Warner Brothers, uh, you name it. I, but I also watched a lot of movies, whether they were animations or not. Um, I was just always into that. Um, and when I got, here's, here's the other thing. When I was going through school and I was going through high school and I, I was thinking about, you know, I would love to be an animator. Um, and I don't know if anybody out there has this issue, but you know, you have friends and family say, "How are you gonna? How are you gonna make a career at that? What are you gonna do with that? How are you gonna make any money?" Um, so the thing was, I kind of listened to that, and I went into science, and you know, I I graduated from San Diego State, and I did that for eight years, but it's not what I wanted to be doing. So my thing is with the Academy of Art is I went to a friend's uh, um, graduation. He was graduating from the advertising department and there just happened to be a new catalog laying on the floor behind me. And I picked it up and I was rifling through it and it says animation degree starts this fall. And I was like, okay, if I'm going to do this. And at that time I was 33 um, and I was like, I better, if I'm going to do this, I better do it now. So I stopped what I was doing. I, I, I was still working, um, but I went back to school full time and uh, was it, oh my God, it was a ton of work, um, but it was well worth it. Um, and there were times that I definitely thought, what am I doing? Um, <laughs> but uh, and still, I all through the time I was going through school, they were, you know, people were still questioning me on like, how come you're not taking over your dad's business? Why are you not, you know, that kind of stuff. But when I got, when I was getting close to being done, I got an internship at Wild Brain, which was a small 2D animation house in, in San Francisco. And um, it just started from that and went from there. And I just kept moving. And it's been, like I said earlier, you know, there's a lot of work, uh, but at, at no point did I ever think that I shouldn't be doing this. And I'm glad I did because I wouldn't have been happy doing something else. 
Is that enough, Hector? <laughs> yeah, to, I mean, it's, you know, it's just one of those things that I think it's the first step that is the roughest. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, I think that's the, you, you either, you take the step or you don't. Um, and, and I, and for the longest time, I just wouldn't take the step. But finally, it was just like, if, if you know, I'm in my early 30s, I got, if I'm going to do this, I better do it now. I mean, I'll be 59 this year, and I've, I've been doing this a long time, and I've worked on great projects, and, it's been, and I've been here at the Academy, Academy of Art for, uh, it'll be 12 years in June, and helped start the department, um, and it's been, it's been great. And I have great people working for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, uh, and I, I'll try to echo this, you know, because I, I understand what you two are both talking about because I, I do these workshops like every week, right? Um, yeah. But students, one thing I'm, I cannot stress this to you enough is, you know, like what you're seeing Brian do live, there is there is sweat equity in this <laughs> There is so much sweat equity in being able to, but here's the thing though, and I, and I got to point this out, like being really good at something, it's not going to happen overnight. And this is why we're, we're stressing, like it will be a journey and a path and a development process. And yes, if someone said, Brian makes it look very easy, very easy. <laughs> I promise you it's not, but maybe for Brian, it honestly is, but because Brian has probably spent a million nights drinking Red Bull and Mountain Dew. <laughs> on art all the time um but i can promise you this some of you that are asking about software we could give brian right now some markers and crayons and he could do the same thing some amazing artwork for concept art but it's the skill behind it everything else is just a tool um correct one of the other things i just wanted to to echo to people though is is it really is the the hard work that gets you there now, David, somebody uh, mentioned this, and I thought you'd be a really good person to talk about this. Okay. They said, you know, I've heard that art is something that you just have to be born with. No. Kind of what I've been taught. Yeah. And, you know, and that's okay, because sure. you, you hear that all the time. But if you mind maybe speaking to wh- yeah. what does this program do? How do we teach people that maybe you weren't born with it? So so here's the thing. We, we have students that come into the program uh, and, and some have been drawing forever. Others, that's something they've wanted to do or, or there have been modelers or whatever their focus is, right? Um, but the way that we have the uh, department structured is, you know, for the first couple of years, you're working on your foundations. You need a strong foundation to get into doing the higher level uh art assets, uh, designing games, that kind of thing. You need to understand how that stuff works before you just jump in and start making whatever you're making, right? So like with character design, like um, Brian's doing right now, uh, you know, you you need to know the fundamentals of anatomy. You need to know your line quality. You need to know all kinds of different things, which which we teach, and that's pretty much, you know, through it's all about repetition and and uh, creating in the beginning, you know, we, we have one class that is a cubes class that's taught in probably, let's see, one, two, three, it's like in the fourth semester, but it's all about painting stuff. You're painting cubes um, and it's like painting glass and painting wood and painting all these different kinds of things. And whether you're a concept artist or a 3d artist as a 3d artist, you're going to have to paint textures, right? But you need to know how to do those things before you can actually implement them. So um, we, we make sure that from the beginning you're learning your foundations and then we, we build from there. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, it's, it is a lot of work. I've been drawing since I was three, like, you know, um, and, and that's, and I honestly, I took a break uh, right after high school where I didn't draw for a while. I had some other jobs where it had nothing to do with drawing. And, um, you know, I needed a little time away from it to realize how much I actually really loved drawing. And I think that little break 
Um, you know, it's kind of like what David said. I'm just kind of echoing the same thing, but um, it's true. When you realize like kind of what, where your passion lies, you need to go back to it because I wasn't going to be happy doing what I was doing for the rest of my life. You know, waking up every day and dreading it um, instead of going and working, you know, at a studio, um, you know, working on my own stuff, you know, on the side. And that's really what kind of drives me is uh, waking up and knowing that I'm going to do something creative almost every single day. Um, yeah. And I think it's really important to look at look at your options like that. So uh, just w one person was just saying, you know, consume, they, they, it sounds like it consumes your social life. It doesn't. At certain <laughs> times it might, um, yeah. if, you're, yeah. if you're doing crunch or anything like that. But um, I like Brian, I've got two kids. Um, they have lots of things going on. I, I try to make it to every event that they have. Um, so, you know, there's, you need that work-life balance. Yeah. And I actually, I think games are, are, game companies are better about that now than when I started in the industry. Because when I started in it, I felt like I never went home. But that was in the early the late nineties, early two thousands. Um, and a lot of the game companies, if not all of them now are, are better about that. Cause when, when the game industry started, everybody was young, nobody had families, but that's not the case now. So um, a lot of the people that are running the companies that started out years ago, uh, have families and have other things that they need to be doing other than making and working for that game. So you, you just, you really have to figure out what that work-life balance is. And really right now, it's especially now with everybody being uh, working remotely, I mean, you could stay in front of your computer all day and all night. You just have to find the time and make the time to, to walk away from it and do something else for a while. Yeah. Like sleep. Yeah. <laughs> or watch a movie or play a game or, you know, exactly. play basketball. I used to play hockey. That was my kind of escape. Yep. Um, you know, playing, playing a sport, you know, if you're not into sports, like, you know, I don't know, find something, you know, I, I know a lot of people that do um, like uh, D and D they do a lot of that. That's yep. kind of an escape for them. Um, you know, if Go you're not, read. You're, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're not really into the more active stuff, but, so, so this, this is an image, I think I'm done with it at this point, uh, especially for how far I want to take this image. Um, but you guys can see how quickly, you know, this isn't perfect by any, by any stance, um, you know, but it, it gets my idea. Out. I have the superhero in this city uh, with these aliens that are attacking. That's kind of, you know, the, the idea that I had. There's lots of little things in here that aren't perfect, but when you're doing concept art, you, you don't have that much time. You like in a studio, you don't have the luxury most of the time to take a piece of art all the way from concept to, to refining it, to making it look perfect. Um, most of those pieces that you see like that Blizzard does that are, you know, that are done up really nice, that, that splash art positions. Those are, are specific artists that are working on those most of the time you get a concept that's kind of half done you get it okay then you refine it then it gets turned into a model then it gets textured then it gets into the game you know what i mean and and that's how rapidly it goes um and those are the things that we try to talk about too about taking your concept all the way to you know completion making sure that um it's done in your turnaround and everything has been completed um you know on time and professionally. So, okay. So I'm going to show, uh, so this, um, is something, you know, a little bit more kind of comic booky here. Hold on one second. Let me hey, go ahead. And you know, a question for you, Brian. Yeah. When do you know when to surrender on your drawings? I got to, I'm telling you, I'm going to speak for the group. <laughs> sure. A lot of people don't know when to stop and they just keep chipping at it and going. That's what a producer's for. All right. So when did you decide to draw the line and say, okay, like this is enough for this piece here? Um, you know, you just kind of get a feeling for it. You know, right at this point I was noodling it. And so I turned it off. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to start a new one right now. 
um, if we have time. I'm not sure how much time you guys want to go for. Um, but, uh, you know, you get to the point where, like David said, you have a producer, you have a deadline, that kind of thing, um, where you just need to stop and you need to reassess what you're doing. Um, you know, uh, sitting down and drawing is fun for me, you know, coming up with uh, new things and coming up with different ideas, that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's really great, um, you know, but at a certain point, you got to send stuff off to either to go into production or to get printed. And so getting that stuff done uh, is a really, is a really, it's really hard to let stuff go. Um, one thing I'll say is, um, you know, it's, I get really kind of obsessed with whatever piece of artwork I'm working on. And it's sometimes it is hard to let it go. It's hard to stop working on it. Um, but yeah, anyway, so that's, that's kind of where I'm at with that, but yeah, trying to, trying to let it go and trying to be on time at the same time. Okay. All right. Any other questions while I'm getting this next piece ready? Anything else, Hector? Uh, well, we just had some long things pop in the chat. So I'll read through and look for some questions here. Okay. Giving your room props, Brian. They're like, oh, thank you. Dude, the room looks great. That's what uh, quarantine will do to you or pandemic quarantine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going to do a turnaround. Go ahead and do that. Are there any other questions in there, David? Yeah, I mean, there's one. It's all here. I'll read it. it in character design portfolio. Yeah. Um, is it, I think it's Caitlin. She said that she heard that redesigns of characters who already exist, such as like Wizard of Oz and Alice in Wonderland, uh, can those be done? And do we do they have to be? You know, if they have to worry about copyright law. Um, if something is in the uh, public domain, right. you know what I mean? It's, you know, it's then you not, don't. Yeah, no, you don't have to worry about that. Actually, um, there are some assignments uh, within the department where um, I have a class called Stylized Character Design where I ask students to uh, come up with two projects where they will be completely unique uh, for that student where you're not following strict guidelines on what exactly you're creating, but you're focusing on creating something new and unique for your portfolio. And so sometimes students can't think of something. So I often will point to like Little Red Riding Hood, something like Wizard of Oz, you know, something like that to where they can redesign it, make it their own and have it be like a really nice piece in their portfolio. Um, you know, learning how to create these character packs um, that you know that i've been you know kind of hinting at right now and i can dive a lot deeper into it if you want if you want to learn more about it but uh, learning how to create you know characters is one thing but learning how to create them for games is another and setting those characters up um it's a lot more technical than you think there's a lot more um back and forth that goes into it um like right now i'm working on just different shapes for the this character that i don't know what they're going to look like yet um, you know, trying to see if how realistic they're going to be or how cartoony they're going to be. This was, you know, somewhere in between. And so maybe I'll do something a little bit more cartoony um, for the second half. Okay. All right. While you're uh, doodling. Yeah. Um, so what about if you want to do your own comic animation video game? How would somebody start with that? And, you know, I, well, I can answer part of that. Okay. So the thing is, and we talk about this all the time, is you've got to think about what, what is that going to be and what's the story behind it? You need to jot down like what the story is, uh, where it's happening, why it's happening. Um, it's basically the uh, five W's of storytelling is, you know, where, when, I can't think of the rest of them right now. Why? <laughs> Why, yeah. So uh, um, so you, you have to come up with what what is that going to be? Um, so if you're going to make a comic, I mean, Brian does this all the time. Um, 
How do you how do you come up with your ideas? Um, you know, um, it, it's kind of it, it's a it's a little complicated when you get down to it yeah. uh, when you start doing the specifics there. But if you want to write a book, what do you think you have to do? Right. You have to write the book. Right. If you don't write anything, you're not going to write a book. And so um, it, it's the same thing with creating anything, whether it's a game, a movie, a comic, you know, anything like that. Uh, movies obviously take a lot more money, a lot more funding. Um, but, you know, writing a book and drawing a comic book, they're very time consuming, but you could make it at home. I do it all the time. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, sitting down, creating a comic book is is one you could be inspired by uh, a character design. You know, that's one thing that could be happening. Um, another thing that also could be happening is, you know, uh, you have a story in your head. And there's a lot of different ways where people kind of concept stuff, um, where they start with a story and then the character designs come later, or you have a writer. Um, and this happens with games too. Like I work with some of the faculty, we've made little games here and there where they have just an idea. They're like, Brian, can you skin uh, this game idea with some art? And so basically I'll take their story, I'll, I'll see what the game mechanics involve and I'll go in and I'll, and I'll work with them on it. Um, and, you know, it's like, okay, what does this need? We need uh, a robot character, a human character, a creature, this kind of stuff. And you kind of look at that checklist. And it's all kind of the same thing, whether it's a game or a comic book. A comic book, you got to have story, you know, and what is driving that story is the characters, you know what I mean? And so the characters are driving that story. What emotion is driving that? And so that's kind of how I approach what kind of emotion do I want to evoke in that story? Um, if you're a game designer, it's going to be like, what kind of mechanic um, are you trying? What are you trying to do that's new and innovative with your game? Are you combining two separate games at the same time? Are you having fun with, you know, uh, Tetris and Donkey Kong Country or something like that? You know, how can you mash those two together? Or how can you mash, um, you know, God of War with... Um, Ratchet and Clank, you know, I don't know. I don't know. That might not be a good example, but you know what I mean? Like, what can you take from Ratchet and Clank that's not in a God of War game and make something new, you know, with it? Um, you know, taking those genres and kind of smashing them together. Um, so th this last, uh, this this one's right up your alley. Okay. So uh, Caitlin uh, is interested in both storyboarding and character design. Okay. Well, so, um yeah, oh, go ahead. No, she was just saying, should she pick one or the other? Um, no, I think that um, storyboarding is all about gesture drawings. You need to really be able to get in there. You need to understand film. You need to understand staging. You need to understand um, your shots and and all of the jargon that goes in uh, to with filmmaking. So not only do you need to understand drawing, you need to understand film. OK, regardless if you're working in, in physical film or you're working in games, so they do a lot of storyboarding in games. Yep. You know, you're storyboarding a sequence of events that are going on you know, instead of, you know, filming that you're acting it out through the computer. You know, I mean, that kind of a thing um, in terms of character design. You know, I know a lot of artists that, that do storyboarding and character design. It just kind of depends on what you're into and what you want to focus on. Uh, but I think those two uh, can go hand in hand. Or, you know, you can be a storyboard you know, artist and just focus completely on that. Um, you know, concept artists, um, you know, we have students that graduate right from the school and they end up being character artists. But a character artist is a really, like, heavily sought after position that is typically given to a more senior person and so you build up to that it's not that it's you know completely unattainable but you have to build up to that uh for the most part well and the thing is with uh most you know most teams there are only like maybe one or two character artists on a game mm -hmm. whereas uh the environment and prop artists I mean, when, when we were working on Lord of the Rings to uh, Return of the King, there was about over 200 people on that group. Um, we had 
I don't know, probably 40 different environment artists and we had two character designers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, as you're moving through you, especially as a concept artist, it's, it, it behooves you to know both because you may not start out as a character designer. Um, but if you can do the environment, which we teach all that, um, you know, learning to do both is, is what you need to really focus on. Um, the same thing holds true for 3D artists. Um, there may not be as many uh, 3D character positions on a team as there are for environment because, you know, you have an environment, you have to build out these massive worlds and there's a ton of stuff that needs to get built for props and environment. Um, they may have a lot of characters, but they may not, they won't, they won't ever have as many uh, character people as they do environment and prop. Especially with a game like, like Call of Duty, where it's basically all environments and props. Correct. Uh, I have a couple questions that came in earlier. I'm just going to throw them out to you all. Uh, okay. Someone had asked about splash art a couple of times. So it said, um, he had put, uh, so wait, is splash art a part of concept art or is that a different career path? Um, it's, it's kind of what I just said, kind of mixed with the, um, with the character artist thing. So it's, you know, you can, you can go and focus on that. We don't have any class that specifically talks about it. Although we cover everything that would be involved in making it. We cover the lighting, we cover the painting, we cover the illustration. We talk about composition. Um, and I think it's really important to, um, when you're building a portfolio, you know, you're not building a portfolio with 50, 60, 100 pieces in it. Right. You're building a portfolio with five to 10, you know, and some people in the industry would probably argue even less. But I, I would say it's quality over quantity. Definitely. And so, you know, if you're, if you're looking to be a splash art artist, you know, you got to look at, at the market of jobs and see what applications are out there. I don't think they're really hiring for that all the time. That's something that you would probably look out for. You know what I mean? Um, I know that Blizzard just, I keep referencing that just because they use it. They have a lot of games that involve a lot of splash art and that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, if you see a studio that, um, that you like and you, you're like, hey, I'd love to be a splash artist for that. Follow the, the artists that work there and try to see like what's in their portfolio and see what other kind of art they have. And so sometimes a lot of those artists will remove their older work and start adding their new stuff. You know what I mean? So their portfolio is as up to date as possible. I know that, you know, I have some floating older portfolios out there that I should probably take down because they aren't representative of the work that I'm doing now. You know what I mean? So, um, so I don't want people seeing older artwork when they could be looking at the newer stuff that I'm working on now. Um, if I was looking for a job, that would be exactly what I would be doing. I'd be trying to update my portfolio as much as I can and taking out stuff that I feel is, irre I feel is irrelevant um, to the jobs that I'm kind of hunting for. I have another question for you all. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, it came in a little earlier. It was a question from Sophia out there. Uh, it says, what kind of art pieces would you recommend to include in a portfolio? Are there specific things that schools and studios consider most important? Um, and I definitely know that it's going to depend on what you're trying to get into career-wise, but any recommendations on how to get started with a portfolio, how to shape a portfolio? Well, I think... Um... You know, one of the big things that we really value is figure drawing. Um, figure drawing will help you with anatomy. It'll help you with um, proportions. It'll help you with everything. And not just drawing people. It'll help you draw cars, props, everything. There are obviously different techniques to drawing cars and buildings and stuff like that. But getting your eye and your hands, you know, getting them working together, um, you know, your brain training it to draw in a certain way. Uh, is really important, but finding what you actually want to put in that portfolio um, goes through a little research. And, it, and it, you know, and I've kind of touched on this a little bit tonight, but 
you know, trying to make sure that you're doing the research of the people that work at the companies where you want to work and seeing what's in those portfolios. Now, you're not just looking at the assets that they're producing at the studios. You're looking at the stuff that they may, may have, you know, left at the beginning of it and seeing like maybe this is stuff they do on the side. You know, being able to do a complete turnaround, showing that you can solve those issues and create, you know, something that's new and something that's interesting and something that maybe people haven't seen before. Um, you know, that might be something that, um, you know, you really want to focus on when you're starting to build a portfolio. Here, I'll, I'll answer because uh, I saw this a couple of times. So over, um, I would have to say, I could probably say this for Brian as well. Um, when, when starting out in the, uh, in the industry, you know, I was, I'm an, I'm an animator, right? 2D animator. So that's what I started out with. Um, it is, I don't know anybody that does everything by themselves in this industry. So um, you're, you're better off learning a skill. Uh, does that mean that's the only thing we ever did over our career? No, I've, I've done so many other things. It's ridiculous. Um, but I didn't start out doing that. Um, you know, we've, I've, you know, started out animating and I've done, I've been the production coordinator. I've been a producer. I've been an editor, I've been, but I had to learn these things over time. And if you're going to get, uh, you know, a degree in something like this, uh, you really need to kind of do the repetition and focus on one area and then do that area. And then if there's something else that you want to do on the side, that's fine. But, um, you know, if, if you want to get really good at a particular subject, you have to put the time in and, you know, trying to do that with five different things. You want to talk about burnout? You will definitely that's, have burnout. That's burnout, yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'm just drawing a weird creature now. <laughs> Might as well have some fun. Draw something a little weird. Uh, question along the way. Let's say I have an idea for a character, but I am a 3D modeler in the studio. What should I do um, to bring that character idea out? Draw. Yep. <laughs> no, and there, there's a misconception where there are a lot of 3D artists that yeah. can't pick up a pencil and use it uh, for the life of them. You know what I mean? Um, and they're great 3D artists, but, you know, um, you know, our 3D artists take a lot of the 2D drawing boot camp classes and figure drawing classes, and they are just as important as, as the modeling courses. You need to learn how to do that. You know, it's David just talked about, you know, trying not to do everything, but being a 2D artist is just as important as the 3D, regardless of, you know, in our concept artists take 3D classes too. Um, you know, and knowing how to do that, doing a block out in, 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 uh, in 3D for a 2D piece. And if you don't know what that means, I can walk you through it. So like um, when David and I went to school, we had to do all of our perspective on, you know, these giant sheets of paper and nothing was digital. It was, it was a huge pain. Um, and it was probably the worst part of school for me. Um, I hated that class, um, you know, but it was, it was totally essential to what you know, we needed to figure out. I, I never used those same skills in the studio, but it taught me a lot about discipline and about how to draw and how to draw things correctly. <laughs> um, you know, but getting back to, um, you know, doing the blockouts, what a 3D blockout is, is using primitive shapes in Maya to make drawing in perspective or drawing a scene in perspective a lot easier. 
You have the freedom to move your camera around. You have the freedom to create primitive shapes to represent more complicated shapes. So when you actually take a screenshot or export an image, you can draw right on top of it. Um, and it makes it go a lot faster. You don't have to think about, you know, the horizon line where that two to three point perspective is, that kind of stuff. And you can just draw freely and be a little bit more creative and have a lot more fun with it at the same time. <laughs> Kyle said, uh, perspective sucked out my soul. Yes. No, it, 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 uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> it'll do that, but it is, it is essential. So yeah, and I understand both ends of it. Yes. Sucked ours out too. <laughs> yeah. I lost a little bit, a little bit of me was lost that, that semester. <laughs> see if there's anything make this guy look a little... i think we're mostly caught up on questions i've definitely so there was one so as a 3d so it really so it's for and i'm sorry if i butcher your name is it devote um as a 3d artist you're mostly going off of whatever the uh, uh concept artists the, you know, the art director and that have approved what those drawings are. And then you're building those uh, characters in 3D, right? Depending on where you work, um, if you're working for a small house, you might have to be the concept person as well, if you can do that. Um, mm -hmm. Working for Blizzard, they, they're uh, 3D artists. So when, so we enter the uh, World of Warcraft uh, th uh, student art contest every year. Um, and the students that participate in that, they have to draw out their environments, their characters, whatever, but then they also have to model it and texture it. So um, we've won or placed every year since the, um, since it started, that was probably like eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Um but not all studios require that, right? Um, they usually, as a as a three D artist, you're not doing the concept. Somebody else is. Hey, David, do you want to reiterate uh, one more time? Just, I think it'll help for people to hear it multiple times. Uh, you know, for for people that are starting from the very beginning, you know, uh -huh. we help prep people with no experience. And I also was trying to type in the chat a little bit about, you know, how we basically can accommodate the full spectrum, you know, people that have experience, they have artwork, you know, we're, we're happy to look at work to try to waive courses. And we sure. also designed the program for people that have no experience. Can you maybe speak to that a little bit yeah. for those sure. people out there? Yeah. So, you know, let, let's say you, you come, I mean, you come into the program and, and you know that you want, you know that you like to play games, you want to make games, um, but you're not quite sure what you want to do with it, right? Um, as as let, let's say it's concept art and 3D art, that's really the art heavy side of things. As, uh, as a game designer, you still need to know how to draw to some aspect to get your point across, but you don't not have to be the concept artist or the 3D artist, right? No. Um, but you need to, uh, you know, you're coming in and taking the, the early fundamental classes where, I mean, really at the beginning, you're, you're learning Photoshop as a tool. You're learning Maya as a tool. We're not having you create all kinds of crazy things because you don't know how to use the tool yet. So um, some students that come in, I mean, I can think of a couple right off the top of my head that um, their, their artwork was okay to not okay, right? It, it was, they just, they just didn't do enough drawing and painting and that kind of thing. But over time, uh, they did that through the program and they got better and better and 
now I, the one that I'm thinking of, she's been uh, uh, an environment artist on, uh, at Blizzard, I don't know, for probably like six, seven years now. Um, so, you know, the thing that we drive home is, you know, you may not know anything. I mean, you may not know how to draw yet, but, but the thing that you have to do is if that's something you really want to do, or you want to learn how to model or whatever, whatever your focus is or game design or even programming for that matter, it's the time you spend doing it. You have to put the time in and the more you do it, the it's repetition is how you're going to get better at it. David, great question in the chat, or it's more of just an uh, ask. It says, can you speak more to what the game design program does? So sure. they always, I'll, I'll go ahead and make the correction. Our, our program, we call the game development program. Right. But the question was what, can, can you speak more about what the game development yep. program does? Oh. Development or for design? Uh, he wrote design, but I just figured, you know, maybe that's just the semantics as far as. No, what... it could be. I mean, because we so for, if you if you're talking about being a game designer where you're actually making the game and not really worrying about the artwork for the game. Um, so so basically for those, you know, we're like I said, you still have to know how to do some kind of drawing to get your point across, because when you're pitching your game idea, um, you have to be able to uh, uh, kind of get that point across to whoever you're pitching it to, whether it's us or a studio or whoever it is. But like I said before, you don't have to be the, the concept artist or the 3D artist. As a game designer, you're the ones that are trying to figure out like, how does this game work? What am I going to do in this game? Uh, what engine am, am I going to work in? Was it going to be Unity? Is it going to be Unreal? Is it going to be some other 2D uh, uh, like construct or game maker or whatever, whatever you're going to be creating that game in? You could have a bunch of little squares and circles on the screen and still make a fun game. Um, we have one class for the game designers. It's called rapid prototyping. You basically make a game a week. And then after those seven weeks are up, um, you pick one of them to uh, expand, expand and work more on, right? So it's, it's all about iteration. Um, as a game designer, you're you know, a lot of the, well, actually anybody in this, there's going to be a lot of stuff that you're, you're drawing and doing that you may throw away because it's really not working the way you want it to and start over. Uh, game designer is the same thing. You're, you're trying to figure out how, how is this going to work? Um, how's this game going to get played? What are the mechanics? And you, you, you have to make those mechanics to see if they're actually going to function. Um, Cause if you don't, if you don't create it, it's all theory, right? So we aren't a theory-based school. We're an applied school. So we, we are making these things. Um, and if it doesn't work, then you try something else. But um, as, as a game designer, your whole, your whole being is, how do I make this game fun? Um, and we, we have so many games from our department. It is crazy. Um, there's one that, that Hector plays all the time when we go on shows. It's called Archer's Duel. Um, it's a 2D game. Uh, it's, it's, it gets played all the time when we're at shows. Uh, Undefeated. I just yeah. want to throw it out there. Undefeated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, but we, have, we have so many games, and we work in so many different, you know, basically for us as engines go, we are – mostly uh, Unreal and, and, um, and Unity. Um, we do use Game Maker and Construct early on in the program. Um, but for a game designer, you're, you're thinking about game theory. How does that work? Um, and we have so many different uh, uh, game designers in our department that have been doing this forever. So uh, like right now, I was saying that we have the, the whole thing that we're doing with NASA and coming up with some games for that. 
Um, and, you know, we have master's students that are coming up with their thesis to do systems design and level design. And so I hope that helps. Are there any other questions? For some reason, I can't see the questions, but I'm just trying to live vicariously through you. Oh, Jesus. I was looking at this and there's like 23 more messages below. <laughs> I, I, I answered quite a few of them. Uh, um, and hey, for, for folks out there, there's going to be a lot of questions and I, I'm, I'm begging you all uh, from the bottom of my heart. My goal is to try to help everybody. And I promise you what we do is we meet with students one-on-one. -on -one and um, what we try to do is, is, is really get into detail about what your career goals are. What kind of things are you interested in? What kind of things are some of your strengths that you perceive? And we also just want to be able to give you some recommendations on which program, which paths are going to line up with where you see yourself going. Uh, people like David and Brian also are constantly looking at portfolio work and trying to also give guidance and give advice on you know, which paths might make the most sense, uh, what kind of courses we can help you with, what could transfer in, what we can waive you from. So it's so complex that I would just tell you, you know, it definitely requires a conversation uh, and, and us to be able to clear things up to make sure that you're comfortable with moving forward, um, but everything is a process before you end up even starting school. So I'm just begging everybody, if you're interested in the process, you have a lot of things you want to go over. We definitely want to start by having a good conversation and going over everything with you so that you're comfortable when you're applying, you understand the enrollment process, you know what you're getting yourself into. Uh, so please, I put my email in the chat. If you haven't already, just send me a quick email just saying, hey, this is me and I really want to set up a time to talk and we'll take it from there. Uh, but I see a lot of uh, questions in the chat. Let to me get to everything before we run out of time. But please, let, let me answer one thing. Please. So, um, so, the, so Rachel asked about, should you be, should you already be at least as good as industry artists before you start applying for jobs? We are going to get you to a point, you know, as long as you put in the time and effort, you know, we'll get you to a point as entry level, right? You're not going to be uh, probably or probably not going to be to a point like with somebody that's been in the industry for, I don't know, you know, 15 years. Um, but uh, what, what we normally try to get students to look for um, are internships before you graduate. Um, that help, that helps as well. But, you know, we, we have, if, if, Hey, Hector, do you have the spring show, uh, link? I do. Well, I'll put it in the chat right now. So if you want to take a look in the spring show for our department, um, and you look up under our, our area and you look at the 3d art and the 2d art and everything else that goes on in there. Um, you can see kind of the level of work that our students are producing. Um, you know, we've, we had, we have people coming right out of school that go straight into sledgehammers, straight into, uh, 2k EA, whoever, um, one of our students just graduated this last fall and he's now a character designer for, uh, Disney, uh, animation for TV. So, um, DreamWorks. What's that? DreamWorks. Was he DreamWorks? Yeah. Oh, I thought he was Disney. Okay, that works too. <laughs> um, so, so here's the thing. Um, you don't have to. Be, you don't have to be, you know, perfect. The thing that they want to see when you're coming out of here is how you think. So. You know, they want to see your finished pieces, but they also want to see how you got there. Um, how did you come up with the idea? Did you do a bunch of uh, small drawings uh, to, you know, kind of figure out how you want the pose to be and 
you know, you worked on your color comps and that kind of thing. Um, you know, how did you get from the beginning of doing that to, to the end result? Um, so, you know, you just don't want to show the, the end design. You want to show everything that leads up to that as well. Um, yeah. Well, here I'll add to that. Um, like right now I have a lot of uh, seniors uh, in one of the classes that I teach, which is a portfolio class, right. which basically gets you ready to graduate. And a lot of them ask that same question. They're like, how, like, what, like, even though they're done with their program, they're still worried about it. And it's something normal. Like it's something, it's a normal feeling to have when you're about to embark on the adventure. And I call it that for a reason, because there's a lot of ups and downs to finding a job, you know, uh, like I got a job at, you know, right out of school at Zynga, you know, and that was my first industry job. Um, and then, you know, I had another job in a couple of jobs in between my next larger studio, um, you know, but then I was unemployed for a few months and things go in cycles too, you know, and, and even though I had that experience, it still took that time to do it. And so, um, you know, staying on top of it, being in the right place at the right time, emailing the right person at the right time, um, you know, is, is all about it. And a lot of the, like, nervousness of of graduating and thinking that you're not good enough well you're looking at work of people that have been like david said have been in the industry for 10 to 15 years of course you're not going to be there they don't expect you to be there but you know just reiterating it one last time i think tonight i think would be probably the best thing is learning how to think like a person who's already doing that job and that's the biggest thing that we try to instill in you Yes, it's the skills. Yes, it's that. But being a good person and understanding, um, you know, how a concept artist, how a designer works, how a 3D model, uh, how a 3D modeler uh, operates within a pipeline. There's a lot of different things that are involved in getting a job other than applying and being nervous about it, you know, um, you know, and so it's, it's all a process. It's all part of, you know, uh, becoming uh, that person who is going to be getting that job and, and, and trying to find your place in that studio once you get there. And it's, it's a lot of work. And if, and if you're up for it, you know, we're here to help you. And the other thing is, is we always try to, if, if we see that you're putting in that effort, you're going the extra mile. And, you know, we know a lot of people in the industry too. Oftentimes we will reach out to those people in, uh, in those studios and say, Hey, we have this really good um, artist or designer. It'd be perfect for this junior position or this entry level position. Um, and we do that a lot. We try to help um, if we see that. And we want to stick our neck out there and help out those students that put in that extra work um, and really kind of drive. Uh, you're, you're almost driving yourself into the studio by doing that too. Exactly. All right. So apparently this guy right here has found this monster in, in the forest. That's kind of this little story I have here. <laughs> All right. Anything else, Hector? No, I think we're pretty caught up. Um, you know, I've had a couple things come in. Uh, you know, I, I just keep encouraging people to send an email to reach out. We can set up a time to talk. Uh, sure. It's certainly out there. Um, Caitlin out there said, I've seen many portfolios that include reference images next to their illustrations, but others don't. And those people still landed a job. Is it necessary to credit image sources for your portfolio? If you are a 3D artist and you're pulling reference for creating a specific model, um, my suggestion is to reach out to that concept artist yep. and ask permission to use their concepts for your 3D design. Right. Um, you know, that may be what you're seeing, um, you know, uh, but for the most part, you know, it just kind of depends. I mean, you know, some uh, model, some modelers, uh, they actually create their own concepts. Some work better off of other people's concepts. Just kind of depends on uh, the pipeline of, of each studio. But the best thing to do is to give credit to that artist that did always give credit, always give credit.
All right, so we have accomplished this piece tonight, <laughs> and we have accomplished these two characters. I like this guy. I like the monster creature we got here. We'll have to do something with that. <laughs> That'll be fun. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's, it's just when it comes to if you're going to use someone else's work to build <laughs> off of just I'm just repeating it because somebody asked me to. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you need whoever artwork you're using. And if it's not your own, doesn't matter what it's for. You need to give credit. Mm. That's that's just because you don't you don't want anybody to misconstrue you as being the one that created it. So. If you're using somebody else's concept art to create a 3D model, you give credit. Or you're uh, doing some kind of fan art and you're putting it out there as your own, but you didn't come up with the original design, but and you're kind of going off of it, um, you still need to give credit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Let's see here. So uh, thank you, Kellen. That's very nice of you. And Oscar, you know, um, and if you if you have any other questions, stick around or, you know, email Hector, email us, you know, I get in touch with us, ask us more questions. We are here. That's that's why we're here. We want to make sure that, you know, if you guys have any questions that go beyond today, if you if you come up with something tomorrow, anything like that, please, please reach out and let us know. Um, we can talk to you about any aspect of the program that, that comes up even after this. Exactly. So you would just have to, you know, uh, email and make an appointment if, if you wanted to, you know, wanted to talk with any of us individually, you just email. You could probably and just best thing to do is to email Hector and yep. he can get you in contact with us. Yeah, sorry. I actually was replying to some emails uh, while I was listening to you guys talk. So I try to do my best to hit people back like quick so they, they know sure. I agree right here. So uh, there's another one. All right, seeing Cool. Thanks for sending the email. And uh, you know what? If you just want to help me with my self-esteem and just email me and say hi, I mean, it would also help you. Exactly. So, um <laughs> But hey, I know as we're wrapping it up, I, I do want to just go out there and say thank you so much to the whole team. Um, you know, we have a, a behind the scenes team that don't necessarily always get the most credit, but uh, definitely shout out to the online education team for helping us put these things on. Uh, our shining star, Maruf, over there hanging out tonight with us. Uh, John Beeson, one of the best looking employees we have in the academy. He's behind the scenes over there on YouTube helping us out. Uh, and then obviously the stars of our show, Mr. David Goodwine uh, and Brian Hess, the super talented. So thank you guys so much for all your time. Sure, of course. Uh, any last questions from the students or if anybody in the chat just wants to give some props to Brian for, uh, and I know some people were out there saying, hey, like I'm worried about my artwork, um, you know, so you got to understand how cool it is for someone like Brian to be willing to draw live in front of people all over the world. Uh, that's definitely got to take some serious courage and guts to be able to, to do that. So a lot of, a lot of shout outs to Brian tonight for, for taking the time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian's and super helpful, big fan of your comic books, Brian. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, your movie poster got a lot of love earlier. I told you that. Earlier too. that was no, cool. and you know, I'll say this one last thing is, there's a reason this room is full of stuff. I need to stay inspired. And, you know, um, you know, I mean, we have been, I've been locked in here basically the last year working every day um, and it's kept me going, you know what I mean? And so uh, surround yourself with the things that inspire you and it'll be easier to create every day. Awesome. Exactly. Uh, Jaden said this was his first time attending an event like this. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for being here, Jaden. That's awesome. Maytal, I, I feel like I answered a lot of questions from these. I remember everybody's name at this point. So, <laughs> cool. Well, if there's no more questions, uh, folks, what we'll do is 
uh, we'll let everybody off the hook so they can get get uh, back to you know whatever they're doing or uh, get some food or whatever it's going to take. So um, I'll go ahead and stay back here in the room for any last minute questions. I'll keep throwing my email out there. Uh, and just looking for you to send in the email, just saying, hey, I want to set up a time to talk. So I'll throw my email here in the chat. But once again, thank you all so much to the whole team. Um, thank you so much. Sorry about that, Kellen. I don't know why I copy and pasted you. Hang on one sec here. You can just delete that, everybody. We don't want to bomb Kellen with emails. Sorry about that. Thanks, everybody. Hope, hope that thank was Thank you fun. very much. And for the record, I've been drawing all day and I was still able to come here and do this. So draw, <laughs> yeah. draw, draw, draw all day if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Diana, email me tomorrow. Totally fine. Hey, Brian, do you have a social media account we can drop in there with your artwork or anything you want to share? Yeah. Um, so I am uh, Hestoons on everything. So Hestoons, that's my website, Hestoons.com. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Instagram. Yep. Awesome. So yep. anybody out there that wants to follow Brian, check out his artwork, uh, Instagram, Hestunes, and all other platforms. Yeah, my phone's blowing up now. You guys are all going to my site. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How cool. Yeah, I never give out mine because it's just pictures of my kid. Everyone will be so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, somebody from Bolivia. That's crazy. Yeah, actually, she emailed me. We were talking uh, uh, to set up some time to catch up. So super cool. Fontana, California, Springville, Utah. Cool. All over. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, hey, gentlemen, thank you for your time. Why don't we call it a night? I'll keep the room open for a few more minutes myself and uh, answer any last minute questions. But once again, thank you so much for your time, you guys. As thank always, you. Sir. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. Have a good night. Good night. Bye, guys. Bye. All right. So I'll hang back just for a couple more minutes. Anybody need an email, a link to anything, a last-minute question, let me know before we close out the room. I'll just hang back for a few more minutes. Thanks, Juliana. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jesus. Go ahead, Sarah, let me know whatever you need, okay? And feel free to email me too if it's more personal or something like that, okay? So. Uh, Caitlin, I, I'm not sure of any specific companies uh, that are highly hiring high schoolers I really, I really don't know of any personally. I, I would honestly.